Well, it's good to see you as we gather together to worship the Lord, and you're very welcome as we meet here in the meeting house in Tober Quay. By way of announcement, just a few things to mention. The, the Smartens Purse shoebox appeal, that those are to be back today, so if you haven't remembered them this morning, then and speak to Claire McVicker and get them to her uh, ASAP, but hopefully they're, they're back and, and leave them just in the, the foyer and beside the hall here. Youth Fellowship, uh, and I should have said as well, the BB enrolment service last Sunday evening, the offering, £376.33, and thanks are passed on from BB for that. So thanks for, for, for that, the 376 and the £33. The Youth Fellowship meets this evening at 7.30 in the minor hall here. Um, then tomorrow night, the, the Elders Fellowship for the Root Presbytery meeting in the hall here in Tober Quay. Uh, at 8 o'clock and Alan Simpson speaking at that meeting. Um, that's for the elders, the elders fellowship tomorrow night here in Tober Quay. And then Wednesday night our midweek meeting for prayer and Bible study uh, at 8 o'clock in the minor hall here and that's open to all. Um, BB and youth club as normal at the normal times. And then next Sunday youth fellowship again and over in Ramon uh, two Sundays in a row just with the, the evening services the, the, and the way it has fallen in November. But tonight's in in, in Toberkey, and please, as you do, young people, bring your Bibles to uh, for for the youth fellowship this evening. Um, and then, as part of our service on the last Sunday of the month, the twenty sixth, uh, uh, we'll be meeting around the Lord's table, God willing, uh, communion as part of the morning service on the twenty sixth of November. So the Friday previous to that will be pre communion. The Sunday evening will be a Thanksgiving service. So that that weekend, the twenty sixth of November. It would in previous years have been today, but it's, it's moved to, to the end of November. And then Friday the 1st of December, the invitation to the Christmas dinner over in Ramon Hall, uh, 7 o'clock for 7.30, starting to eat, in other words, at 7.30, Irish Cuisine, the, the caterers providing that there'll be a program uh, after the meal. So that's a, a night for everyone uh, that, that's able to come along and uh, make it known to family or friends. The Friday the 1st of December, 7 p.m. There's a sign-up sheet for that in the vestibule in the porch there. Uh, if you want to attend that, then please do plan to sign up for that. Now, there's a, I think it's £20 the cost that's on the sheet, but it's £20 the cost for the meal. Um, the, there's a children's version if the children aren't eating the full meal. There's a children's version at a, a lesser cost. I'll, I can get the details of that for you as well. Um, but that by way of announcement. And then... Uh, Hopefully I haven't left anything out there, but as we think of remembrance in this Remembrance Sunday, Psalm 46 brings great comfort to many of us, I imagine, on this day and in many a day. And Psalm 46 verse 9 tells us that God makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear and he burns the chariot, chariots with fire. And wars are very easily started. And conflicts rise up all over the place, even within our hearts and within our homes. And how we need the peace of God and how good it is to know that our gracious God brings peace and has sent our Lord Jesus to be the Prince of Peace for both Jew and Gentile. And so I'll ask the congregation to stand as we remember those who in wars and conflicts gave their lives for our freedom and our protection as we think over two world wars and the conflict in this land and conflicts around the world where our people have been serving and seeking to bring peace we remember the loss of many lives and the freedoms that we enjoy as a result and so we'll ask the congregation to stand in a moment's silence we remember in silence and don't worry about the noise of little ones it was for such noise that men and women laid down their lives let us remember
for our tomorrow they give their today at the going down of the sun and in the morning we will remember them we will remember them and as you remain standing our call to worship again from psalm 46 god says come behold the works of the lord how he has brought desolations on the earth he makes war cease to the end of the earth he breaks the bow shatters the spear burns the chariots with fire and so god says be still and know that i am god and i will be exalted among the nations i will be exalted in the earth we come to worship the one who rules over all and the one who is the God of justice and the God of grace. We're going to sing God's praise to hymns at the start of our service. O God, our help, and then Lord of the years. Let us worship God.
Let's come to God in prayer. Let us unite our hearts. Let us pray. Eternal God, our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you this day that we can rejoice in you. We can trust in you with all our hearts and not be disappointed because you are the gracious and the great and the everlasting God. You are kind in all your ways. And we thank you for the greatness of your love. And Father, we thank you for these reminders in song that you rule over all. You rule over this rebellious world, this broken world. And even as you warned Adam and Eve in the garden of what rebellion would bring and the cost and the pain of it, yet you did not abandon the work of your hands and you spoke a message of salvation. And while the world and we came under a curse because of Adam's sin, and we feel the pain and the reality of it and the brokenness of our world. Yet you spoke to Adam and to Eve of one who would be born of woman, the seed of the woman, who would bring salvation, who would triumph over the serpent. And we thank you that in the fullness of time, your son came forth to be born of Mary, to take to himself a human nature and to walk this earth and to live our life that we feel to live, to live it perfectly. And we thank you that there is a righteous one, our Lord Jesus. Lord, we confess that we do not live those obedient lives that you call us to, that we're wayward and sinful, that we think we know better than you and we do things our own way instead of your way. Lord, forgive us our many sins. We see the impact of sin and the pain and the heartache it brings not only within our own hearts, but in our own homes and in our land and throughout the world. We see the hatred that abounds. We feel the pain of it. We see the loss of lives around the world this day. We hear of it and we're almost numb to it. So much do we hear. And Father, every human life is precious and you have taught us so. For we're made in your image. Though it be marred by our sin, yet we see something of that image in mankind. And so, Lord, help us to treat human life as precious. As we think of the great loss of life through two world wars and the conflict here and conflicts in other nations where our people have served and sought to bring peace and stability. Father, the great loss of life. And we sometimes think of it and we hardly can take in the enormity of it. Help us this day and this day that we mark by remembrance. Help us, Lord, to get a glimpse of the horror of war afresh. And the brutality of it and the pain of it and the suffering. Help us to realize the great freedoms that we have in this land. Freedom to meet here this day around your word. Freedom to worship you. Freedoms to live out our lives. Freedoms even to go our own way rather than yours. And Lord, we pray that we might value the freedoms that we have and that we would not be a people who go our own way, but that your great mercy would grip us and your great mercy would draw us to repent of our sin and rebellion and to follow after you with all our heart. Lord, as we think of the sacrifice of many for the freedoms we enjoy, we're mindful of the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the Righteous One, stepping in and laying down his life to atone for our sins and to pay the debt we owe so that we could know freedom in all its fullness, the spiritual freedom set free from sin and its power and brought into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Thank you, O Lord, for your mercy. Thank you that you love us more than we can even take in. And Lord, as we gather here today, we're mindful of others unable to gather with us. And we pray, Lord, your peace in their hearts, that it may abound, that you'd watch over and protect them, that you'd put something of your joy in their hearts this day, no matter what their circumstances might be that they might be able to look to you and rejoice. For you comfort broken hearts and you heal 
troubled hearts. You change lives, and so we are comforted and we rejoice. As we gather here in this scene of time, Father, to praise you, thank you that we can spur one another on by our very presence and by our voices, that we can be praying for one another even as we gather here, praying for those around about us, for the touch of your hand upon us. And Father, we thank you that we join with the song of the souls of the redeemed in heaven and the angels who do your bidding. And heaven and earth rejoice in our great God and Saviour. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We turn in our Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 8 first of all and then 1 Corinthians chapter 3. The passage we'll be turning to in 1 Corinthians 3 is referring to the church as the temple, God's temple. And 1 Kings 8, we read of Solomon and the building of the temple in Jerusalem long ago. King David had longed to build the temple but was not allowed to do so by God because of the blood on his hands. And, and then he was told, your son will build the temple for my name. And Solomon partially fulfills that. Realize it's a partial fulfillment when Solomon builds the temple. A greater son than Solomon builds the temple. Our Lord Jesus Christ builds the temple, his church. So these foreshadowings, all these things in the Old Testament, shadow lands. It's a foreshadowing of a greater fulfillment. First Kings chapter 8, after First and Second Samuel, you come to Kings. First Kings 8, verse 1. Let us hear God's word. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of all of the tribes, the leaders of the fathers' houses of the people of Israel, before King Solomon in Jerusalem, to bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. And all the men of Israel assembled to King Solomon at the feast in the month Ithanim, which is the seventh month. And all the elders of Israel came, and the priests took up the ark, and they brought up the ark of the Lord, the tent of meeting, and all the holy vessels that were in the tent. The priests and the Levites brought them up. And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who had assembled before him were with him before the ark, sacrificing so many sheep and oxen that they could not be counted or numbered. And then the priests brought the ark of the covenant of the Lord to its place in the inner sanctuary of the house in the most holy place underneath the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread out their wings over the place of the ark so that the cherubim overshadowed the ark and its poles. And the poles were so long that the ends of the poles were seen from the holy place before the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen from outside. And they are there to this day. There was nothing in the ark except the two tablets of stone that Moses put there at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the people of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. And when the priests came out of the, the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. And then Solomon said, The Lord has said that he would dwell in thick darkness. I have indeed built you an exalted house, a place for you to dwell in forever. Then the king turned around and blessed all the assembly of Israel, while all the assembly of Israel stood, and he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who with his hand has fulfilled what he promised with his mouth to David, my father, saying, Since the day that I brought my people Israel out of Egypt, I chose no city out of all the tribes of Israel in which to build a house, that my name might be there. But I chose David to be over my people Israel. Now it was in the heart of David, my father, to build a house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel, but the Lord said to David, my father, whereas it was in your heart to build a house for my name, you did well that it was in your heart. Nevertheless, you shall not build the house, but your son who shall be born to you shall build the house for my name. Now the Lord has fulfilled his promise that he made, for I have risen in the place of David, my father, and sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised, and I have built the house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. And there I have provided a place for the ark in which is the covenant of the Lord that he made with our fathers when they brought them out of the land of Egypt. 
And then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands toward heaven and said, O Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath, keeping covenant and showing steadfast love to your servants who walk before you with all their heart. You have kept with your servant David, my father, what you declared to him. You spoke with your mouth and with your hand have fulfilled it this day. Now therefore, O Lord God of Israel, keep for your servant David, my father, what you have promised him, saying, You shall not lack a man to sit before me on the throne of Israel, if only your sons pay close attention to their way, to walk before me as you have walked before me. Now therefore, O God of Israel, let your word be confirmed, which you have spoken to your servant David, my father. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, how much less this house that I have built. Yet have regard to the prayer of your servant and to his plea. O Lord my God, listening to the cry and to the prayer that your servant prays before you this day, that your eyes may be open night and day toward this house, the place of which ye have said, My name shall be there, that you may listen to the prayer that your servant offers towards this place, and listen to the plea of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place, and listen in heaven your dwelling place. And when you hear, forgive. And ending there at verse 30, we turn to 1 Corinthians 3. After the Gospels, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians 3. The Apostle Paul writing about the church. It's God's field. It's God's building. It's God's temple. We've looked at field and building over a few Sundays. 1 Corinthians 3.16, Paul writes, by the Spirit of God, he writes, verse 16, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? And the you is plural here. If it was Old English, if you're in the King James, it'll be ye. It is the advantage or one advantage of Old English. It distinguishes between you, singular and plural. So the you is plural here. Do you not know that you, plural, are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of the world is folly with God. It is written in his Old Testament quotation, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise and they are futile. So let no one boast in men. For all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future. All are yours and you are Christ's and Christ is God's. Amen. We thank God for these Precious readings from his holy word. If the girls and boys come to the front for a few moments, please. Good, good morning and thank you for coming forward and good to see you. We had quite a long readings there from 1 Kings and a short one from 1 Corinthians. But we're reading from God's word and... And the long reading from 1 Kings, Solomon, he's praying for God to come near. And then he asks this question. He asks, it's a great question. Will God really dwell on earth? So you can read that for yourselves. Don't need me to read it. Will God really dwell on earth? Solomon was praying for God's presence to fill this beautiful temple that he just completed the building of in Jerusalem. But he's, he's, he's even amazed at the thought, will God really dwell on earth? Because Solomon knows that God is far bigger than the temple. He knows God's presence fills heaven and earth and more. And he says, will God really dwell on the earth? And girls and boys, grown-ups, in the Bible, God gives us 
different pictures of how he does dwell with his people. Back in Genesis in the garden, before Adam sinned, he walked, God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. But then God told Moses and his people to build it, to make, I was going to say, I did say build, to make a tent. Well, they were building inside the tent. Make a tent, a special tent. Now, Moses brought God's people out of what land? Where were the slaves? Anybody remember? Where were God's people, the Hebrew slaves? And God sent Moses to bring them out of that land into the promised land. Egypt, you got it. You got there, Egypt, and they're going to walk the whole way, no cars, to the promised land. And God told them he would be with them. You know what they lived in as they traveled from Egypt to the promised land? Tents, they all had their tents, and they were grouped to their family, their tribes. But in the middle of all that grouping of tents, night by night, there was one special tent. The picture of it there is something what it would look look like when it's cut out different layers of material over it. Now, we've cut out a section so you can see inside and you can find visuals of all of this and study it or even try to make a model of it and amazing the detail of it. And you know whose presence was going to be in this tent? God's. And one little part of this tent especially. You see at the front there, there's someone standing some of the priests, or maybe the great high priest in his garments, and they would be offering sacrifices. Blood would be shed for the sins of the people, and then they would be going in with that blood, and it would be poured out, and, on, and they go, they'd go to the, the altar. And the great high priest once a year would go to the Holy of Holies on behalf of the people. So the, the first part's a holy place, and there's a table there with bread and a sign of God meeting with his people, and there's light there. And, and then on in, there's this holy of holies, a really special place. Do you know only one person ever went in there, and only once a year? The person that went in there was the great high priest. He only went in on the day of atonement on behalf of the people. And God made his presence known in a mighty way in that little place. That was the place where God's glory was in a special way. The, the tabernacle, the tent. And then later on, we read of Solomon building something just like the tabernacle, but now it's not a tent, it's a it's a building made out of stone and wood. The next picture shows you something of what Solomon's temple would have looked like in Jerusalem long ago. And it's not there. It was demolished when Babylon overran Jerusalem long, long ago. But the beauty of this, and again, it's cut out so you can see into it. What, what, the roof is cut away and the walls cut away so you can see in. But this massive big stone building, overlaid in gold inside. Beautiful building, great expense. And again, outside there's that big... What's that big thing down closest to us there full of? Do you see it, a big container? Any idea what's in there? Yeah? Water. Water. For symbolizing washing and and the need to be washed and made clean. And then over there, there's steps going up to something. You know what's, there's fire there, yeah? What what are they doing there? They're burning animals that are killed as sacrifices. So lambs and cattle would have been burnt there as a sacrifice. And the smell of all of that's going up because sin requires death and animals were dying in the place of the people and then the blood of those animals would be taken in and, and sprinkled in a sign of cleansing and the priest would go on behalf of the people into the holy place this big part of the building then on beyond it you can see you can sort of see the barrier into the holy of holies at the very back and pictures of angels are carved out angels overlaid in gold and that's the holy of holies where God made his presence known God's presence. Solomon asked when they built this building, will God really dwell on the earth? Now, you sometimes tell me, don't you? I heard it not so long ago from somebody, but I can't see God. And you can't, because God is a spirit. Just like the wind, you can't see the wind. You can see the effect of the wind. But I can't see God, so how do I know he's there? Do you know how you know? Because God dwells with his people, tent, tabernacle, temple, But you know, when our Lord Jesus came, he described himself as the tabernacle or the temple, the real tabernacle and temple where God's presence is known. So the next picture shows you a picture of someone because it's it's not about the outer appearance of our Lord Jesus. We don't know what his outer appearance looked like, nor do we need to know. But in the man Jesus, God's presence is known. He's the temple. He's the tabernacle. You know, in John's Gospel, When we read in chapter 1 about the Word becoming flesh, 
says he tabernacled amongst us. He's the tabernacle. And then in John chapter 2, he describes himself as the temple. He's the place where we see God's presence. And now the temple is the church because Jesus sends his spirit. And so remember last week we were saying the church isn't this building made of wood and stone or whatever. This is the meeting house where the church meets. The church is you and me, people who believe and love Jesus. We're the temple and the Holy Spirit dwells in the church. God dwells in his church and his temple. And you know, that's still not the whole story. Because we don't see the church in all its beauty yet. Sure we don't. The church today is a bit of a mess because it's made up of the likes of me and you. and We're a bit of a mess. But one day we'll see the beauty of God's temple in all splendor and glory. When Jesus comes back again at the end of time, his people, his redeemed all around the world, those from different languages and backgrounds and, and, and different cultures that are saved by trusting in Jesus, and they'll dwell in new bodies on a remade world. God isn't finished with this earth. Now, that picture of the world there, the circle or the globe, I've got the sea there, and maybe I need to maybe do something with that, but I don't know how to change that. But there'll be no more sea, we're told. But God will dwell with his people on a remade earth. Heaven and earth will be one. And the picture of the person in the middle there, that's our Lord Jesus. In other words, Jesus in the midst of his people. So as you think of God's presence, tabernacle, temple, our Lord Jesus dwelling, we see God. Think about this for a minute. In the visible man, Jesus, we see the invisible God. Can't see the invisible God, but in the man, Jesus. That's why Jesus came, so that you and I would know what God is like. And as we read of Jesus in the Bible, as he walks off the pages of the Bible to us, we see what God is like. When we think of Jesus, we see what God is like. And in glory land, when we go to be with our Lord and Savior in glory land, we will see Jesus. We'll see the beauty of our God. He will fill his remade world. He'll fill us, the church, his temple, his dwelling place. That's what I'm looking forward to. I'm looking forward to seeing Jesus, to being in his presence. I'm looking forward to a new heavens, a new earth, a home of righteousness. And I hope you're all looking forward to it too. The wonder of the future that God has for us in Christ. And we're going to sing together of God's great love and protection. It's based on Psalm 27. You're my light and my salvation. You'll know the tune way beyond the blue. You'll know, you'll know the tune, I hope, all right. You're my light and my salvation. We'll stand to sing.
We continue to worship God as we bring our tithes and offerings. Thank you to, to Audrey and to the choir for that anthem. We come to God with our prayers of intercession. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for that beautiful reminder and that precious hymn that was written out of heartache and grief, and yet one through faith in Jesus able to say, it is well with my soul. In the midst of all the trials and the troubles of this life, you bring stability and you bring peace to our troubled souls. And Lord, we thank you that that experience can be ours this day too by faith in Jesus. Father, we think of those who serve around the, the world seeking to bring and to establish peace for those who serve from our nation. 
whether it was army or air force or navy and we pray lord that you'll grant them help in carrying out their work that they will be able to maintain peace in troubled regions of the world and even in our own province as well we pray for a new chief constable lord we pray father your your help for our ps and i for your mercy upon them and we pray for your leading and guidance in the days that lie ahead and father we pray for those chaplains who serve in army and air force and navy lord we pray your hand of mercy upon them we think of mark henderson and philip wilson and simon hamilton among others and we pray, Lord, that you will be their strength and their shield and their portion this day, that you'll encourage them in their work and bless their witness to those they live out their lives among. And grant that there will be people coming to them today even to talk about the things eternal and to seek your guidance and your salvation. Lord, make them instruments for your glory in a very needy part of your world. And so we pray, Lord, for those who serve, that they would realize there is a saviour and that they realize that there is eternal security that can be found in our Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray for the witness throughout our police service here, for those who know and love Jesus to bear witness to your amazing grace. So raise up people with a passion to make the good news, news known to their colleagues. Father, as we think of the turmoil around the world, whether in Gaza and Israel or in Ukraine and Russia or in Myanmar or Yemen and the great heartache and loss of life, we think of North Korea and the persecution there and the lack of any freedom. And Lord, we pray that your people will continue to make known your good news, your gospel, even in the face of persecution, even at the cost of their very lives. Grant them that resolve to speak the truth in love. For we see the great need of the gospel of Christ's peace. We see the need for Jew and Gentile alike to come to know Jesus and to be united in Christ. And Father, the great need for the Middle East is for the gospel. And so we pray, Lord, that your good news will flourish there, even in these days of heartache and turmoil. Help those who are seeking to bring aid to the needy, grant that their efforts might be successful. We pray, Lord, that those that are bent on violence and destruction, that their plans would be thwarted. We pray, Lord, for the bringing to justice those who carry out atrocities. And we pray, Lord, for your mercy and that people will be able to show mercy one to another. And so we pray even for the Nations of the world, as they seek to bring influence, Lord, grant them wisdom to know how to speak into that situation and how to act in that situation. And Father, we think of those families grieving the loss of so many lives. And Lord, the bitterness of hearts that will inevitably result. And we pray, O oh God, your mercy would abound and that the message of forgiveness would rise up. For with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are to be feared. Oh, Father, how our world needs to be made over in you. Earthquakes and volcanoes and violence and war and poverty and fears abounding. Lord, it all speaks of a broken world in need of remaking. And we're thankful that you will remake this world and you will do so perfectly. And so we look for that day of our Lord Jesus and we cry, come Lord Jesus. And yet, Lord, we live in a day of grace, a day of opportunity to see people gathered into your kingdom, into your church, to see people saved by your grace. So give us a resolve and a boldness and an urgency to reach people with your good news. Heavenly Father, in our United Kingdom, we think ourselves very good at remembering. And yet, Lord, we don't think for long and we don't think in any depth of the many lives that were laid down in two world wars and in our troubles here and in conflicts around the world even since. Lord, 
we often think little and we often don't value life the way we ought. So help us, Lord, to remember the horror of war, the pain and the heartache of war, the brutality of it. And we pray, O God, that you will bring wars to an end around the world. Grant hope in situations where there seems to be no hope. And Father, we thank you for the measure of stability we know in our province and in our land. And we pray, Lord, for your mercies to abound to us. And yet, Father, as we think of our United Kingdom, we think, Lord, of the reality of hundreds of thousands of little lives terminated every year in this United Kingdom. And Father, we pray for the protection of little children in a mother's womb. Lord, we pray that you'd grant to a young generation rising up, Lord, a, a realisation of how precious every life is. Grant it to an older generation too, that realisation of how precious every life is. And that the laws of our nation would be turned back to your word and your law, that your commands would be upheld and valued and seen to be for our good. Lord, may a young generation rising up realise that every human life is precious, made in your image. May we treat every life as precious. And so we pray for those that have been through the pain and the heartache of abortion, that they might know that there's forgiveness and peace to be found in Jesus. And we pray, O oh God, your healing and your touch, and we pray, Lord God, your mercy. But Lord, for our nation, we pray, forgive us our many sins. Forgive us our laws that swing a fist in the light of your law. Forgive us, Lord, when we think that we know better than you. And have mercy upon us as a nation. And lead us in your paths of righteousness. And grant a holy boldness to the preachers of your word to speak the truth in love. Lord, raise up preachers of your word for our church in this region and for the mission field. Raise up those with a passion for your glory. And Lord, as we bow in your presence, we bring to you loved ones who are feeling their frailty, whether of body or mind or soul. And we name loved ones to you and all that they're going through. And we ask that you will strengthen them and help them and help those who medically care for them. Give them great wisdom. We pray for loved ones who are grieving. We pray, Lord, for the family of Sam Kidd. We pray for Pat and for Mandy and Paula and their loved ones that you will continue to make your face to shine upon them and grant them your comfort. Lord, we need you. We cry out for you. In Jesus' name, amen. The church is God's field, it's God's building, it's God's temple. That's the, the language of 1 Corinthians 3. I think I maybe said last week it wasn't as if Paul was writing to Corinth and he remembered Corinth, that's the place I spent 18 months, it's a city, and there's no point talking to them about a field, I need to move on to the building talk, to the language of a building, they'll understand that in a city, in this modern city of its day, a rebuilt city of its day, a very important trade city in Corinth. It wasn't that Paul thought the agricultural field garden metaphor won't work, they'll not understand and he moves to building. It's rather Paul is moving from field or garden to building because these are biblical pictures. God dwelling with his people in the garden and in the field, that's, that's Eden. And God walking with his people, God dwelling in the midst. And then the language of building and temple, that's the unfolding of history and all these different pictures for the church and layer upon layer. And so Paul moves from the, the field picture for the church, the church, the place for growth, in other words, that will not grow as Christians apart from the church in isolation from the church. God has given us his church and designed that we be a part of it. And we need the fellowship of the church. The church is a building, a place of security and stability built upon the solid rock, the foundation of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then as he goes on, the the unfolding of this building, it's the building's a temple. In the language of tabernacle or temple of old and, and all those Old Testament shadows are pointing forward. 
And as we look at God's temple, God's church today, and remember that the, the scaffolding's still up around it, it's still a work in progress. And so we do not now see the church as it one day will be seen in glory. And so the church is a bit of a mess because it's made up of the likes of me and you as we trust in our Lord Jesus. The scaffolding's still there, still a work in progress. God's not finished with his church yet. Mercifully, he's not finished with us yet. How patient is our God and Saviour. And you know, as we think of the Middle East and all sorts of views of prophecy and end times, and there will be those with a certain view of prophecy or their understanding or interpretation of prophecy, and they'll be thinking, you know, the temple, a literal temple needs to be rebuilt in Jerusalem again now. Solomon's temple is long gone. Then another temple was built, Herod's temple that was there in the days of our Lord Jesus. The Roman Empire saw the end of it, AD 70. It's long gone. And there's a reason they're long gone, long gone because of the will of God that they're long gone, because they're but temporary. Because of the rebellion of a people, they're but temporary. And you know, some Christians would even give a fortune, probably a fund, and seeking to fund some building project in Jerusalem of a Jewish temple and the reoffering of sacrifices. But Christian, that's not what our focus is to be, nor do I believe that's what's coming. You see, the temple now is the church. That's the temple Christians ought to be longing to see established in Jerusalem and everywhere else on earth. The church of our Lord Jesus Christ, and thanks be to God, his church is being built there. There are people from a Hebrew and a Gentile background in Israel coming to know Jesus as their Savior and Lord, realizing he is the Messiah. And that's the building of the temple that we ought to be yearning for. God's temple, the church, a place where God dwells in the midst. Later on, Corinthians will discover that individual believers are described as the temple, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. But here in chapter 3, it's the church collectively. The you in verse 16 is the plural. Ye, ye are God's temple. The church collectively. Didn't our Lord Jesus say where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. He dwells in his temple, in his church. He makes his presence known. And first of all, to say in regard to God's temple, the church, is that it is God's. Now, that's stating the obvious. You'll say to me, do you not know verse 16 of 1 Corinthians 3 that you are, ye are God's temple, collectively the church? God's temple. Not man's temple, God's temple. And so while because of all the sin of mankind and the divisions within the church, we might speak of denominations and denominational labels, and we're part of a Presbyterian church in Ireland, that's the label. But the church is far bigger than that little label. The church is God's temple. It's God's church. And so it's ruled by God. It is Almighty God who declares how the church should function. It is to him that we should be looking. And the church in every age is always good at coming up with ideas that we think are better than God's ideas and God's ways. And we think if we modernize the church and make it more appealing to a secular or an atheistic mindset that somehow or other that will impact the world for good. And it doesn't. It, it doesn't work. And a liberal church just dies. Liberal in the sense in regard to its doctrines, theology, its standards. It just dies. Because nobody wants to be part of it. It will die. I'm thankful that it will. Because the church needs to be built God's way. God rules over his church. It's his temple. It's his. And so we come to his word to hear from him so that we know how we are to do church, to use that language how we are to live out our lives, what we're to do when we meet together Lord's Day by Lord's Day. And it is Lord's Day that we're to meet in a special way and we meet on other occasions through the week as well. But it is God's church. He rules over it in mercy. It's his. Marred as we are by sin, we're not yet what we yearn to be. As we trust in Christ and his redeeming love, our sins are forgiven. 
We're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, but we still sin. And we long for a day, that day that's coming when we see Jesus face to face and there'll be no more sin. But we're God's church. That's who he has made us to be, Christian. That's who we are collectively. It's not that with all our effort, we become God's church. We are God's. Do you not know, Paul says to the Corinthians, don't you know that you're God's temple? Don't you know it? That you're God's temple. Amazing. And you know, we probably don't really take it in, even today. We are God's temple. Christians, mixed up and messed up. We're God's temple. Secondly, this temple is indwelt with the Spirit of God. Verse 16, and that God's Spirit dwells in you, in the plural you. God's Spirit dwells in his church, in his temple. Amazing. This is stating the facts of what God has done in Christ. He has made us to be his temple and he has poured out his Spirit upon us the day of Pentecost onwards. The Spirit filling the church. That's what we ought to be yearning for. Even as Ephesians speaks of the Christian yearning to be filled with the Spirit, that prayer that ought to be the yearning of our heart every day, Christian, that we'd be filled with the Spirit of God. So we should be yearning that the church as we meet will be filled with the Spirit. God's Spirit is in his church. And yet we ought to be yearning that we will know more and more of that awareness of the, the Spirit filling his church as we gather together in fellowship. That we will know the nearness of the Lord's presence even more real to us than the presence of others around about us. We are God's temple. That is who he has made us to be by his grace. And by his grace his spirit indwells his temple. Do you not know that God's spirit dwells in you? Is there no awareness of it? No sense of it? And dwelt by the spirit of God. Oh, that we would yearn that the holy presence of God, it's the presence of God that makes all the difference, you know. It's his presence that makes the feast, as the old generation would have put it. It's his presence. His holy presence, his gracious presence in our midst, it's his presence that makes the difference. It's his presence that will make the difference to a watching world that has no time for the church. It's the holy presence of God. It's his presence how we ought to yearn and pray for that sense of the nearness of his presence for that outpouring of his spirit upon us do you not know that you're God's temple and that his spirit dwells in you thirdly God's temple the church is holy verse 17 if anyone destroys God's temple God will destroy him for God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. It's who God has made you to be. You are that temple. You're holy. We think of holiness, we think of moral uprightness. That's, that's where holiness gets to. But initially, holiness in biblical terms is about otherness. It's about being set apart, God being far above and far removed. Solomon knew that God was holy, and he wondered, even as he prayed, he wondered, could God really dwell on the earth? Could the God of the highest heaven, the God whose presence is far greater than heaven and earth put together, could God really dwell on the earth in, in our sinful, wayward earth among sinful people? Could God really dwell among men? Solomon wondered at it because he knew of the holiness of God. But he also knew of the grace of God. And we're holy. And so... In days of tabernacle and temple, there were vessels that were set apart for holy use. Tumblers, whatever, plates, they were described as holy because they weren't for ordinary use, they were for special use. And you may have things in your house that are set apart for special use. And if you've got that grand cup in China and stuff like that, don't bring it out for me on special use because I may well break it and then I'll be in trouble. Just keep that for special visitors, someone else. But we have things that are set apart for special use and usually we forget where they are for we rarely use them. Special, set apart. And Christian, you are set apart as special for God. That's how much God 
loves you and loves me, sets us apart for his special service. And yet, sadly, we would rather run the things of the world and, and be messed up and mixed up in all sorts of things rather than be the holy people that we are set apart to be. Do you realize the great privilege of being set apart? Holy. Oh, by nature, by our old sinful nature, especially when we're young in faith or maybe young in years, we feel the awkwardness of being set apart. And we know when God saves us that we're different now. He has done something. We don't quite understand what he's done, but we know there's life now in Christ and we have an appetite for his word and we pray that that will continue and it will grow and, and we have a longing to grow in his grace and to learn of him and to be with his people and, and we're set apart. We don't quite understand all that he's done and even to eternity we'll not fully understand all that he has done the depth of the wonder of it. But we know we're different now. But we struggle with being different from our friends and our family and our work colleagues and those we do business with. We don't like standing out like sore thumbs, but we know we're different. And God has set us apart to be different for him. That others will see that the way we live our lives is out of fear, a loving fear of the living God. Because we love him who first loved us. We're holy. The church is holy. And so think of it not as just as how this impacts you as an individual, and it does, but think of how it impacts the church as a fellowship, as, as a building, as the body of Christ, to use that metaphor. The church is holy. It's precious to God. You know, the way you or I, we think of the church will reflect how we think of God. If we have little regard for the church and the fellowship, and that's what we're speaking of. When we're speaking of the church, we're speaking of people brothers and sisters in Christ. If we have little regard for the church, if we don't think we need the church, if we think we can just go through life fine as a Christian without the church, it's reflecting what we think of God because God has a high regard for his church. He has a high regard for his church. It's holy. And maybe we need to repent this day of our attitude toward God's church. His holy Catholic, apostolic church. That word Catholic means worldwide, universal. There is but one true church. And it's not got any other label on it. It's not Presbyterian. It's certainly not Rome. is not the one true church. The, the Catholic church is the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. Those who are saved by his grace, thrusting him from all the nations around the world. It's a worldwide church. Far bigger than any denomination. And how we ought to have a love for the church of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ. How we ought to love to meet with them. To spur them on. And God does a work in his church in our lives, doesn't he? He molds and shapes us. It's the same as he does in family. We feel our brokenness in our family life. Where we even let down the people we, we love. And the church's family. We feel our brokenness and God rubs off the edges of us. There's plenty of rough edges to be honed and, and he does it within the fellowship of the church as he tests our patience one with another. He tests our love one for another. He shows us our lack of love and lack of patience and he brings us to his throne of grace time after time where we cry out, Lord, make me more like you. Grant me your love and your patience in my heart with my brothers and sisters in Christ. Give me a love for your church, your holy church, that the world might see that we're different because we're yours and that others might be drawn into the fellowship of the church and the love of the church. God's temple, the church. It's God's. It's indwelt by spirit. It's holy. Fourthly, it's, it's, it's Christ's. So... Trinitarian, it's, it's God the Father's, it's the Spirit's indwelt, it's, it's Christ's. And toward the end of chapter 3 here, he speaks of that. This church belongs to Christ, all things belong to Christ. The very end of the chapter. All things are yours and you are Christ's and Christ is God's. Verse 21, so let no one boast in men. Some of them were looking to Paul and some were looking to Apollos and some were looking to Cephas, that's Peter. And they're saying, we follow them as individuals and we think these others aren't any good. And, and they were making much of men and divided over men and, and following them and, 
and they were bringing great harm to the church. And Paul tells in verse 21 that don't boast in men. All things are yours. Paul is yours. Apollos is yours. Cephas is yours. They're all these leaders are all a gift to the church. They're not divided over their message. So don't be making division. And not only are these leaders yours, but the world and life and death, the present, the future, all is yours. The future is yours. The present is yours. The world is yours because it's Christ and you are Christ and Christ is God's. The church is Christ and if we're Christ, then we have all things. You know, you're maybe struggling to hold on to things and you're struggling to hold on to life. You're struggling to hold on to health. You're struggling and wondering what will the days ahead be like and what will I hold on to? You'll not hold on to much, you know. We leave it all behind. We leave it all behind. We like to think we're in control in the present moment. But you know, we don't even know if we'll have another breath, really, do we? We're not in control. But if we're Christ, then all things are ours. The present is ours. The future is ours. The world is ours. It's all ours. It's all yours in Christ. When you're part of his church, his temple. And so you don't need to fear the present or the future because Christ rules over all. You're Christ and Christ is God's. There's great order within the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Son willingly serves the will of the Father, but the will of the Father and the Son and the Spirit are all united. But there's this orderliness in the Godhead. And the Father out of love sends his Son to save us. And the Son out of love for the Father in his name comes to save us. And the Spirit poured out upon us from the Father and the Son. And so, because we are God's temple, if we be Christ, Paul says, do not destroy God's temple. Take great care how you treat the church of Jesus Christ. Take great care. Far more care than you would if there was a temple in Jerusalem today. Take great care how you treat the temple of of Jesus, the church of God. Corinth was full of temples, you know. All sorts of God and goddesses pagan religions, all sorts of sensuality and immorality, a part of it. There was even the pantheon, the the temple for all gods. So in case they missed some out, this pantheon that covered them all. But there's only one temple that really is lasting value. That's the temple of God, the church of Jesus Christ. That's the temple we ought to want to see established around the world as people come to Jesus. Take great care how you treat the church for if anyone destroys God's temple... God will destroy him. What a warning. What a warning. We'll close with singing the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, our Lord.
me the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with you all evermore. Amen.